एक या द पैनलिस्ट एस को होस थैंक यू थैंक यू वेलकम एवरीवन टू वन फोर्टी फोर्थ एडिशन अ वेरी ब्रेड एंड बटर टॉपिक फॉर अस एंड हाउ वी हैव हाउ वी हैव बीन वीविंग इट सो टुडे a very special speaker and very special chairperson can we have it full screen make it full screen and go to the next slide please yeah full screen if possible so uh, what we uh, what we'll be doing is keeping everyone on the mute mode the panelist can unmute themselves the questions will be invited in the chat box uh, bhaskar is ready to answer all the questions and uh, i'm handing over the session to professor dr sofan pati sir he is the chairman of this program uh, sir over to you thank you thank you alim thank you very much welcome everybody to this 144th episode of thursday music and it is so kind of you being here next slide please i i shall also cross over the slides of our very much well known and always present vibrant moderators dr amrit patel sir professor of psychiatry my tech medical college business so and editor of the president of indian psychiatric society was sustained branch and secretary of indian psychiatric society eastern zonal branch and next slide please dr alim siddiqui Professor of Psychiatry, Ras Lucknow Medical College. Next one, please. Treasurer, Indian Psychiatric Society, and uh, he is also the guest guest faculty in Amity University and Vice President of IMA Lucknow. Two vibrant moderators. Without going to further details, because they are so much well known, let me introduce our honorable chair persons. Next slide, please. Dr. Basudev Das, Director, CI Piranchi. Welcome, sir. and he has quite a well known face in odisha as well as in this program he is director at cip ranchi he did md in 1900 2002 on from cip and situated in sarkand mbbs from arjikar medical college and hospital in kolkata couple of publications national international journals delivered guest lectures at wto sponsored cme is held at cip ranchi during 2002 2009 Delivered guest lecture on management of sexual dysfunction and the psychotropic drugs in annual national conference of Industrial Psychiatric Society, held at Rinpas Ranchi. Delivered guest lecture on diagnosis, assessment, and pharmacological management of ADHD in eleven victims, same year five case system general grants. Co-chair scientific subcommittee during Sages two thousand nine held at SMIMS Kanpur second. He has got much more accolades, but this is just a few. And welcome, Dr. Das. Next slide, please. Dr. Manoj Kumar, next slide, please. Sriyatra slide, Mukherjee. Dr. Manoj Kumar, he is MD from CIP Ranchi, DNB from Ivas, and the SRC from Ivas. He is a stand professor at Ivas, Delhi. His areas of interest involve adult psychiatry, addiction psychiatry, and forensic psychiatry. He is an editorial board of two journals. And more than eleven publications in these journals. Welcome, Dr. Manoj Kumar. Now onwards, the meeting belongs to the chairpersons, Dr. Basudev Das and Dr. Manoj Kumar. Please take over and introduce the speaker, which will be displayed, and introduce the topic. And please carry on. The meeting is yours. Uh, thank you, sir, for your kind words. <clears throat> and uh, as you all know that uh, today is the next slide part. also uh today is a very well known topic we will be discussing uh management of uh, positive symptoms psychopharmacology and uh, speaker not management it is something else okay okay Uh, positive symptoms and psychopharmacology uh, so uh, speaker is a very well known and he is considered the living encyclopedia 
and uh, Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee, you all know him. Uh, he has uh, areas of interest in the molecular biology and uh, he loved to understand pathophysiological basis of the psychiatric symptoms. And uh, he has also interest in treatment resistance in psychiatry and transdiagnostic understanding. And his goal is in psychiatric, to make psychiatry again the master spot in the medicine, a spot reserved for the medical specialty dealing with the master organ of body. So over to Manoj, uh, if you want to say something. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity to be here today present with you. And uh, I, I also, I also welcome, I also welcome Dr. Vaskar Mukaji and uh, I would be, uh, everybody knows that actually you know, this uh, positive symptomatology in the child group, in the adults and in the geriatric population, management is bit, you know, tricky. The same medication may not be applicable for all the three. So we'll try to see how this, uh, what is the molecular basis of this one and how we can able to manage these positive symptoms effectively in children, adults, as well as geriatric population. And also special consideration will be given to uh, the women gender and uh, whether those psychotropics that we are using in males can have more serious side effects or is there is anything which is better for the management of these women with the positive symptoms. So with these words, I uh, look forward to the great presentation of Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee over to uh, our main speaker. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Please stop the slide share. Um, so mm. I would share my slides, but before that, I have to bring the misconception. Please stop the slide share, Shreya. So the last one, yeah, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. The thing is, we have to understand that the topic is not pharmacotherapy of positive symptom. We are not gunning for that. We are doing a three part series in demystifying schizophrenia. So we would start with explanation of each symptoms of schizophrenia. First, we would unravel positive symptom. And with those unraveling, you would start getting understanding that how positive symptom is formed in brain and how we can start treating them. The second episode would contain how negative cognitive symptoms come into play in brain and it would contain more psychopharmacology or rather more molecular psychopharmacology on how drugs work in positive, negative and cognitive symptom. And it would deliberate on various topics that in 1990s, Kane et al. published a study of schizophrenia, treatment resistant schizophrenia, and clozapine in 2023. Is that study even relevant? Is clozapine still the gold standard drug? When the original study was comparison with 60 milligram haloperidol, we ever use 60 milligram haloperidol nowadays? We don't. There are hundreds of new molecules, hundreds of ways to treatment standing there, holding to our old axiom that uh, clozapine is the base drug in schizophrenia. Does that matter? Then there would be other deliberations on metabolic syndrome and schizophrenia. Always olanzapine is blamed. Always clozapine is blamed. Always others are blamed. But there is an interesting group. I am not talking about slides now. I would start slides before I am preparing the stage. Otherwise, you would be prepared for a few topics like here is delusion, here is dopaminergic dysfunction, 
here is physiology expansion and now give me give this medication this is not the way this presentation series is going on so anyway let's go back to what i was talking about we would also discuss metabolic syndrome and schizophrenia and how metabolic syndrome is integral part of the disease known as schizophrenia and bipolar the disease group which produces this symptom they have their own metabolic syndromes so is olanzapine and clozapine are the one that produces this symptom or are the process is already going on and we are just seeing some of the outcomes of the process because believe it or not most of us who sees or have seen a few thousand patients of psychosis they know that there is a significant chunk of patient who don't gain weight with clozapine who don't get weight gain weight with olanzapine that they many of them lose weight so we would talk about those things too and in third episode we would talk about the role of psychosis in grand scheme of things how a group of diseases which starts in the womb come out at psychosis as different period of time as mania in different other period of time and ultimately and come out with various neurodegeneration at appropriate age or appropriate biological clock determined age and how we can prevent that final natural degeneration so with that we would start the first episode of this series so no i am not talking about some dopaminergic dysfunction glomerulonephritis dysfunction no i am peeling back the symptoms layer by layer to show all of the psychiatrist that how they are formed and what we are missing this is an episode to address the invisible elephant in the room and now i am starting the screen broadcast this is the name of the series molecular psychopharmacology from pathophysiology to clinical application or the whole series is actually based on translational neuroscience and it would try to bridge the research finding at bedside to clinical application at bedside psychosis is actually the last frontier of the puzzle named brain so when we talk about this puzzle we have to start at positive symptom and their pathological expression and some of the pharmacology because oh, unless we cover negative and cognitive symptom we cannot fully go on in the psychopharmacology department so today is step by step peeling off positive symptom so what is psychosis what is psychosis for uh, you or anyone else yes we know the dsm criteria the D, the icd criteria but are the criteria definition there is a non medical definition that it is a group of disorders where touch with reality is lost but what is touch of touch with reality that is no there is no definition at all rather there are thousands of psychopathological and psychological explanation of psychosis 
and multiple stringent cross-sectional imaginary criteria. But there is no scientific brain-based pathophysiological definition. If we ask anyone to define rheumatoid arthritis in rheumatology, they would give a precise joint-based definition. We cannot give that in case of psychosis because we don't have that. There are thousands of classifications, DSA, MICD, Chinese, Russian, Korean, South Korea has created their own, Japan is coming up with their own, but these are just cross-sectional and temporally bound criteria, and they don't have any real world data and observation backing them up. No patient come with all the symptoms of ICD, DSM criteria. Most of the time, we actually stretch the criteria to include the patient. So, this is the most frustrating observation in our subject. We don't practice actually. So, for this discussion, psychosis is a pervasive, continuing brain dysfunction syndrome that is characterized by intermittent or continuous presence of various dysfunction symptoms related to every aspect of brain function. So, what that definition means? That definition means this dysfunction would affect every brain function. Brain has multiple level of function and each of the function would be involved in psychosis. Now, this dysfunction symptoms can have intermittent or continuous expression by hyperactivity of brain excitation process and associated neuroendocrine or immune system dysfunctions. But the underlying pathophysiology would go on either very slowly or rapidly and it would not stop when the external expression is stopped. And it would have emotional symptom, cognitive symptom, somatic symptom, sensory or perceptual symptom, motor symptom and behavioral symptom. Some symptom would be prominent. Some symptoms would not be noticeable un unless deeply examined in each patient. So, it doesn't mean in this definition of psychiatrist, uh, psychosis, I am directly stating that criteria, unless criteria where some criteria are present and some criteria are absent. In definition, all the symptoms would be present in all the patients. Every patient would have emotional symptom or cognitive symptom or somatic symptom or somatic, uh, sensory symptom, motor symptom and behavioral symptoms. Some would be more. Some would be more prominent and would be readily visible. For some, we have to dig around. We have to probe. But there won't be any psychosis without presence of all the symptoms. And historically, we are actually seeing re-emergence and reinvention of unitary psychosis and major psychosis modified by cognitive, molecular, systemic, and connection neuroscience. These are the four branches of neuroscience that I will use to explore and reconfigure the psychosis phenomena. And as I am seeing unitary psychosis and major psychosis, you can understand that for the purpose of this discussion, there is no Kreplin and his dichotomy.
so positive symptoms and they are brain based dissection the complete travel from phenotype to genotype peeling one layer after another today i would not be exploring genotype and molecular pathotype because that would make this lecture a few hours long and i am aiming to keep this lecture within 1 hour 15 minutes that part we would cover in next section so what are positive symptom these two are classical delusion and hallucination these are considered as positive symptom rest all the symptoms they are variations of this so if you if we can present a completely brain based network based connectomic based explanation of delusion and hallucination without resorting to any psychological mambo jumbo or without resorting to any psychobabble we would achieve what we have started the reconfiguration of positive symptom from brain point of view so we first have to start with delusion from phenotype to connectomics so for delusion we would start with the definition of delusion and then we would proceed from one topic to another what is delusion if thanks to marrow thanks to damps and thanks to every other coaching centers and they are psychology based psychiatrist teacher even a final year student would parrot the definition of delusion fixed firm belief that is not amenable to any logical reasoning to the contrary and not in accordance to the prevailing socio cultural norm but here the first question that should come to any students brain who is not daydreaming is why the norm is prevailing socio cultural standard why we a group of medical professional who are dealing with brain we are bothering with setting the norm at prevailing socio cultural belief why there is no explanation what my society believes or what my society practices doesn't have any role in setting the norms of what i talk what i behave and what i believe if society is setting all the criteria then that is not biology that is sociology so we have to understand when whenever we include socio cultural norms we are actually acting as enforcers of social boundaries and social justice and we are trying to prove who is not maintaining social standard and who is maintaining social standard that is not the job of a medical professional we have to be very clear about that so it's time to drop the socio cultural norms from the definition and the definition becomes fixed firm belief that is not amenable to any logical reasoning to the contrary now if something is pathological that thing must have a physiological equivalence that is basic understanding of biology and medical science so 
we have to understand what is the normative expression or physiological expression of this fixed firm belief that is not amenable to logical reasoning to contrary because that has to be a normative trait so let's start thinking about our world that is surrounding us there are lots and lots of animals in them simple animals if a line of ant is going around carrying a food and we, if we disturb that line what would happen after some initial chaos the line of ant would go on the same path so every animal has a preference in everything it does and feel it's an integral part of self if we observe non human beings in our life like just as i have given example of ants and if we observe their interaction with their surroundings we would get live evidence of this phenomena another uh, let's give another example those of us who live in the area where elephants are very common they would find that there are elephant corridors and that if the elephant corridors are disturbed then the then hello hello was there. i out of no no just for a moment hmm? oh, now you are back now you are back hmm. so the thing is there are elephant corridors and if someone disturb the elephant corridor then every hair type of hill breaks loose because elephant doesn't let go of their corridor this is true for every animal being so animal being our preferential being and they have a like and dislike and when the preference of habitat life choices and internal rhythms are challenged every animal becomes distraught confrontational and flight fight or freeze response ensues so we can see this each one of us in this lecture ecological system or universe has some self determined cognitive biases also known as preferences and we would always resist preventing them or changing them and that makes this so called delusion extreme expression of a normatively distributed physiological cognitive state of life we even have a few name of it choice perspective and at the core of it is adding personal valence to a decision option decision option means value based decision option so if we are seeing value based decision and making process and its normative expression then there are some physiological purely physiological expression of it some are part purely physiological but so extreme that they can be included as patho quasi pathological and some are definite pathological of a trait we can explain this if we talk about blood pressure let's say what is the range of bp in a normal person it is 130 by 90 130 to 90 in systolic bp and 90 to 60 in diastolic bp this is the normal range of a resting human being but if the human being is straining to lift 
a hundred kg weight, would this same BP be maintained? It won't. The BP may suit up to 160, 100 or more. So this is a extreme but normative physiological trait of blood pressure. Similarly, in case of human valence, uh, human or animal valence and choice, there are extreme physiological traits, which are fanaticism of all kind, be it political, be it social, be it religious, be it humanitarian, be it altruistic, and every flavor of human choice. When a person is showing fanatic trait, that person is actually showing extreme adherence to a fixed choice which is acceptable or unacceptable to his or her surrounding socio-political condition, but that person would not let that choice go. Similarly, behavior and process overuse of all kind, the so-called behavioral addiction and the so-called addiction to various chemical addictants are also extreme but in a way normative physiological trait of choice because here also a group of individual gets attached to a particular pattern of value-based decision making process and they go on repeating that might be beneficial for them for example if someone is reading all the time if someone is working all the time if someone is treating patients all the time just because that person loves to see patient if someone is gardening all the time they are socially accepted but again they are extreme physiological trait of choice and similarly use of excessive use of mobile phone which is being termed as now mobile addiction or internet use internet addiction which is nothing but actually extreme but normative physiological trait of choice also becomes quasi pathological but more normative do tell me if you don't understand what I am talking about. Because what I am talking about is actually trying, that is going to go and class with all your own state of choices. Because all your life you have believed behavioral addiction as kind of diseases. But now I am telling it is not. So your choice based decision making is now in direct contrast with the scientific fact. So you might or might not like it and you might or might not be able to understand it. If that is the case, do give me the feedback and we can start the dialogue there. Now, if we think that way, then a lot of human achievement including civilization founding, technological advancement, all becomes expression of this behavioral trait. And all human suffering is also expression of this same behavioral trait. The suffering would involve every social, economic, political, military damages ever been inflicted on this planet by humanity. That is how vast the normative trait which is pathologically expressed as delusion goes. So time to review the role of choice and value in our decision making process. Whenever you are making a goal based or value based decision making, we start with 
the representation of the situation in our brain we think what are the problems what are the feasible actions what are the internal states that we have what are the external states that we have let me simplify this by giving an example i am sitting here talking with you and trying to override your choice in your value based decision making process and so i am talking a lot i am feeling thirsty i should take a water so my in my case the problem is i am feeling thirsty and i have a sort of broken voice so what are the sets of feasible action for our, for me i can take a water or i can delay it for some time my internal state if i am very thirsty then drinking water becomes immediate choice but if i am not that thirsty i can delay it the external state if i have a water bottle beside me then i would be able to avail the choice or otherwise i have to leave this presentation and go to nearby fridge and get a bottle of water so now once i get or these feasible actions and my value uh, and an evaluation of my internal state and external state i would start attaching value <coughs> of each action whether i take the water bottle and drink or not my value depending on <coughs> whether i think taking water is appropriate in in the middle of a talk or not whether i think leaving the uh, screen would be appropriate for me or not and these things these are emotional values these are my values and these values i am getting giving importance to actually these values would determine whether i would drink a water or not then based on based on these values i think i have talked enough and i do feel this strategy and my throat is parched so i am taking water so i have taken taken the action based on my valuation of the process because i don't care for much protocol so i would select the action that would give me more practical feasibility and for me that is drinking of water now i would start evaluating the outcome i have drunk the water my voice is not breaking anymore i am feeling much comfortable and there is no uproar for audience from audience so audience doesn't really care whether i drink water or not and i have learned through each of these processes and i would have reapply this learning in my future same kind of situation and in future if i am giving lecture to this same kind of audiences then i would directly go to water drinking without going through this process this is value based decision making process and the very simplistic approach to categorize this process to different brain regions are this do not remember this slide do i request you because unfortunately brain doesn't allow for this simplicity and this is a 2006 or 7 diagram which doesn't have any value standing in 2023 so don't remember the names of this area just remember the actions 
okay so what brain areas and brain networks give us the choice and values the network of selves means autobiographical memory and autobiographical rather autobiographical memory retrieval because there is no memory network the network is concerned about memory retrieval autobiographical learning and autobiographical reasoning so that this constitute the network of self now network of learning as a whole network of memory formation as a whole network of executive function they come secondary to others and network of attention and vigilance they come secondary to others executive function attention and vigilance are actually similar networks but they would come secondary so our first exploration would be networks of self and network that means autobiographical memory autobiographical learning and autobiographical reasoning this is very schematic view of autobiographical memory emotions contribute to it specific events contribute to it general events contribute to it life history contribute to it and our self description which changes from time to time based on our evaluation of our self also contribute to it so what is autobiographical memory retrieval this is of two type one is conceptual remembering one is perceptual remembering perceptual remembering is forming images of as i experienced representation of personal experience it serves decision making in well structured scenario that are grounded in an external constraint for example this water drinking of mine would be perceptual remembering because i have experienced it and this is something that has happened in a well structured scenario and there is an external context because i was trying to teach you how value based decision making process work and so whenever there is perceptual remembering the same kind of event would needs to be repeated and the person would be triggered to remember that that is perceptual set of autobiographical memory retrieval then there is conceptual remembering it is actually integrated or holistic representation of multiple personal events it is not based on such single event and it serves reason making processes in novel or ambiguous scenarios where there is no previous context where everything we are doing is based on experiment no past experience and we are trying to delete as an when basis when we say we would figure it out on the go we are actually relying on conceptual remembering now comes the network of self what is network of self it is the network which gives rise to our self perspective self evaluating perspective i am this i am comes to comes from this network of self in or around 1995 to 2000 this type of conceptualization of network of self started initially it was determined that 
कॉटिकल मिडलाइन स्ट्रक्चर्स एक्चुअली कोलेट एंड ऑर्गेनाइज द सेल्फ रेफरेंशियल स्टिमुलाई एंड दे टूगेदर यूज टू फॉर्म आवर न्यूरल बेसिस ऑफ सेल दिस वॉज द कॉन्सेप्ट इन टू थाउजेंड टू टू थाउजेंड टेन और बाई टू मीडियल प्रिफ्रंटल कॉटेक्स यूज टू थिंक एज रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ सेल्फ डॉसोमीडियल प्रिफ्रंटल कॉटेक्स यूज टू बी थॉट एज evaluation of self anterior cingulate used to be thought as the area which is concerned with self monitoring and posterior cingulate used to be thought as the area which is known to be cause integration of everything into a cohesive self sadly this simplicity is not the nature of any biological organ because for efficiency nature has packed a lot of thing in a single organ and when we are talking about the master organ brain the complexity grows million folds yes whenever there is brain my favorite denomination is million because brain is million time complex than we think but million time easier than our ego thinks so current time that is starting from 2020 to 23 autobiographical network can its ideas are revolved now we think in term of three level modes of self interceptive processing which represents the internal sensory signals for various body organs and it gives us some idea about internally where we stand and also it gives us some understanding how our different organ system is placed and how our immediate contact environment is placed then extraceptive processing extraceptive processing is representing extraceptive and proprioceptive signal directly related to one's body means how our body is positioned in a three dimensional space how we are placed visuospatially or various other audiospatially and other various spatial context and it connects the internal body and external environment the third one is mental self processing represents self related to non bodily signals such as i do this kind of work i possess this make of car i have this job i work in this sort of way and these are my these and this relationship these are my these and these responsibilities and other thing whenever we think about this way these abstract ways of describing our own self based on social environmental and various other things which is incorrectly known as metacognitive level we are describing our mental self processing and these three level integrate to form our self so what is the neuro imaging correlate of that interceptive processing is done by insula thalamus dorsal anterior cingulate cortex as well as parahippocampus and various other internal internal uh, signal receiving areas the extraceptive processing is done by insula 
inferior uh, left both sided insula right sided inferior frontal gyrus anteromedial prefrontal cortex and along with that left temporoparietal junction right temporoparietal junction and right sided premotor cortex the mental self processing is done by both insula and the posterior cingulate cortex anterior cingulate cortex anteromedial prefrontal cortex thalamus and temporoparietal junction on both side as well as a few other association areas this is the interoceptive processing area this is the extraceptive processing areas and this is the mental self processing area though this should be more aptly named as external socio cognitive and environmental self processing anyway so if we do a summation of all different neuroimaging trials that has been done to find these areas out then we would find out some interesting tidbits number 1 insula is actually related to all three dimensions of cell temporoparietal junction is related to extraceptive perception extraceptive processing as well as socio cultural and metacognitive self processing anteromedial prefrontal cortex is again same premotor cortex is again same posterior cingulate cortex is only concerned with mental self processing comparing if we start comparing our understanding in 20 years we would find out that instead of a generalized cortical midline structure now we have a more clear picture of all the hubs and nodes that are involved in various level of self processing that is an improvement but this would be the sum of the nodes and some of the halves because this would be supplemented by cerebellum and its processing of all external senses this would be supplemented by deep brain nuclei and their modulation this would be supplemented by our whole sensory processing and other thing so this is the core self area and there are the extended self area why i am spending so much time in the self because this is the problem area for most of the psychiatric symptoms once we end this three part series i hope you would be more aptly able to appreciate that so once the value processing done another thing remain that is the execution of this value processing because any normative animal trait like preference or balance that we are discussing blood sugar blood pressure cholesterol level 
and every available human normative biomarker level the control or expression of the trait becomes of paramount importance because let's say diabetes diabetes would only happen if the control of blood glucose level and it various function in various tissues is impaired the control has to be impaired then only the pathological function would come more prominently yes if the normative trait forming areas are dysfunctional there would be dysfunction and there would be expression of that but if the control mechanism is still intact the dysfunction would be much less and the animal can mask that by various means so in the control in case of brain and preference and value system is provided by three networks of brain executive control systems extended reward system or motivational network because what gives reward is the motivational and injury control networks which prevents us from giving a value based response so not only the value processing network we have to have executive dysfunction too for abnormality of value processing to become a pathology and whenever we are talking about executive network we are in a soup a soup created by 50 years of meddling since any form of functional brain monitoring has come because what has happened is most people working in neuroscience and understanding of brain are not psychiatrists neither they are neurologists they are people who have done doctorate degree in some basic branches of biology that excludes any form of clinical sense and that makes them have no understanding of a total totality of body they just understand this part and that all that is all so they have created a nine different names of executive network there is central executive network there is cognitive control network there is dorsal attentional network there is ventral attentional network there is executive control network there is executive network there is frontoparietal network working memory network tax positive network you name it and there is one executive network but problem comes when we start probing these names and we would find that most of these network doesn't have the name execution in their working description so we have to start doing a bit of separating the chaff from the grain thankfully a lot of people again none of them are psychiatrists none of them a very few of them are neurologists now but namanna nobody absolutely nobody of them are psychiatrists they are now doing this separation of chaff from grain and they have found out that each of the names represent different brain areas which very few overlaps so we are doing something wrong we have to define executive network and we have to define what they do thankfully 
in recent past just four months ago five different groups of non medical people working on non medical non biological people working on this area has created their meta analysis and in their meta analysis they have plotted these networks compared them and ultimately sum them up resulting in formation of a definite set of executive network these networks are these four color coded ones one is frontoparietal network it is present in all four cluster all four color cluster one is executive control network which is seen in in this green cluster in this green cluster it is executive control network the dorsal attentional network and tax positive network is in this red cluster and they represent a set of executive control all the others they don't have any such representation frontoparietal network represented in in violet actually is mirror image of the general frontoparietal network so these are the executive function network and they are this function to channelize the value based decision making process would lead to pathological expression of value based decision making process known as hallucination once the executive system function is done motivational framework basic reward system or motivational system comes into play i would not elaborate that because stall kub and every tom dick and harry in addiction psychiatry including a few naughty one actually have given too many lectures on this so this is the so called reward circuit what i would be more interested in extended brain reward system or extended motivational circuit because these are the extensions that give motivational circuit its name they are orbit orbital prefrontal cortex temporal pole dorsolateral prefrontal cortex <coughs> hippocampus anterior insula anterior thalamus amygdala and other things they give the brain motivation to carry out anything along with the core reward system so now come the break the inhibitory control networks which says do not do this value based decision making do not go into this choices do not give special meaning to this value this is the break and if break is failed then and there delusion should appear so break is the possibly the major deterrent factor in formation of delusion in all people because every people has value based decision making process and every people have their preferences what is preventing a specific person to work like a delusional person is the break 
और इनिविटरी कंट्रोल नेटवर्क अनसरप्राइजिंगली एवरी इनिविटरी कंट्रोल नेटवर्क स्टार्ट विथ सेलिबेलाम बिकॉज सेलिबेलाम कोलेट्स ऑल द सेंसरी एंड मोटर प्रोसेसेस एंड कॉग्निटिव प्रोसेसेस एंड इट कीप्स अ सर्वाइलेंस ऑन ऑल दिस प्रोसेसेस एंड इट अलोंग विथ पॉन्स एंड थैलामस एग्जैक्ट a graded inhibitory control to motor cortex supplement motor cortex pre motor cortex and prefrontal cortex to do this graded relaxation or to act as a break these are the various areas in this side which collaborate with cerebellum we can see that rostral brain basal brain these are the various other areas frontal brain all are involved but the process start with this neglected little brain which is there which monitors everything and does the inhibitory control so with the basics and normalcy out of the way it is time to get into pathology and it is time for me to end boring you because i know this type of basic understanding is very boring when it is being talked to consultants but if you understand this bitter pill and swallow it you would get to solve the puzzle of delusion hallucination and everything in psychosis and you would be able to see psychosis in complete different light so let's configure the pathology how many ways can physiology change to pathology in value processing system the individual component of value processing systems are malfunctioning and then attaching more value to autobiographical processes this regarding environmental sensory input or the executive control and its components are malfunctioning and the person is acting up under the influence of improper value processing or both one and two this starts the fixed firm belief that is not amenable to any logic and person start acting on them and so the gross brain connectomic pathophysiology of hallucination stage 1 sorry sorry the delusion stage 1 is that and the flat gate to second pathology a hallucination starts so what other brain processes get added to delusions to cause hallucination sensory discrimination processing and integration process three dimensional placement of an of animal in response to his internal and external environment these two other brain processes needs to be disrupted along with executive and inhibitory control as well as value processing system to create hallucination so sensory discrimination process those of you who are in child psychiatry surely asking themselves but we have read it in autism adhd what it is what it is doing here sadly that is fault of dsm and icd that is not fault of science or brain brain doesn't believe in dsm icd so what is sensory discrimination process 
that is a this is a central and peripheral nervous system network process that helps an individual to apprise and discriminate different sensory input based on quality of sensory information intensity of sensory information duration and interval of sensory information and direction of sensory information and various other produced quality of any sensory information this is the network of sensory discrimination it has multiple component the vestibular in incoming information goes to vestibular nuclei ras gets involved here superior colliculi for orientation and sensory integration cerebellum for balance and coordination and emotional integration thalamus is sensory relay and arousal modulation hippocampus is spatial processing and episodic memory cortex is body awareness fast pass from back to this is actually one of the largest whole brain brain spinal cord and peripheral nervous system wide network sensory discrimination network is consisting of peripheral nervous system brain and spinal cord and ultimately it gives rise to proprioception it gives rise to vision it gives rise to various other sensory inputs this is normal healthy sensory transmission it the sensory uh, transmission is relayed in brain stem then insula receives them and gives interceptive in, uh, inference and gives awareness of sensory experience then prefrontal cortex adds executive function to it causes multisensory integration emotional regulation and ultimately we feel that sensation our sensation needs to be felt to understood to understand it that comes in this three way the the skeletal part of sensation it adds the muscle of brain awareness to it and it adds the skin and other beautification to the sensation to give it a meaning so what are the sensory perceptions that are perceived there are two kinds long range short range long range are visual and auditory they give us the much needed environmental input to keep us totality inside our environment i know you are thinking that again i have started boring you know if you just try to understand this one you would understand hallucination then short range and immediate range sensory perception as smell taste touch proprioception and spatial perception spatial perception and proprioception they are also special senses and all the patients of so called somatic symptom who respond who come to you and say i have vertigo i have instability are actually representing hallucination of these two processes this tip bit i am sharing because i am fear, I, I i do fear that you are losing interest so amongst this sensory perceptions which needs rigorous discrimination there is no point in guessing because it is obvious that long range sensory perceptions needs rigorous discrimination because they help in predator vigilance they help us to stay aware of the danger in surrounding environment they give us the sense of accurate placement of us in surrounding environment they navigate us through external environment and they help us in interaction with external environment with confidence and with a bit of prior knowledge and they are also there to observe receive and respond to social layer of external environment 
no sort of immediate range perceptions can do these things so that two things long range sensory perceptions are invaluable to us now amongst these two which is more prone to failure of sensory discrimination it is always auditory failure because auditory is a single quality sensation whereas vision has multiple quality in get to it let me explain auditory is a single sound the sound can have tone cannot have tone sound can be melodious or not but that's all thus sound doesn't carry any other thing whereas in case of vision when we see a thing we see its shape it its color its actual appeal to us its various texture its depth its various other thing which we don't see in auditory stimuli due to this auditory perception is inferior to vision then auditory is also very time sensitive sensation it doesn't last a sound doesn't last our ears have very limited hearing range so our sound doesn't last much time but for vision an object or any view lasts long we can check recheck and recheck it again in case of auditory we are deprived of this sensation this level of control in auditory pathway there is very less check and balance system because auditory pathway is shared by vestibular pathway and these two systems share most of the same pathway and due to this there is very less space allocated to auditory pathway in people who have intact vision and so auditory processes are more error prone so overall auditory processing system is very simplistic what the so i have given you a lot of theory so what these theories mean the most common type of sensory discrimination failure is auditory and that's why most commonly encountered hallucinations are auditory because it is very very easy to fool auditory sensation to fool auditory sensation in terms of distance in terms of tone in terms of intensity in terms of everything auditory auditory is the most imperfect long range sensation and how we can ensure that that what i am talking is true there is a myth in psychiatry long myth that congenital blindness is protective against schizophrenia psychosis it's actually a bullshit but this is a theory that goes up rejected goes up again and has always found a group of faithful followers that can be explained by these same causes which makes auditory hallucination possible due to in congenitally blind there is highly developed auditory processes and very high auditory integration there is also <clears throat> a huge space of brain which used to be devoted to visual processing is allocated to auditory processing and this makes them have a long range sensory process that is auditory 
which is as good as vision in case of dim and so it is hard to fool their auditory processes and that is why they don't develop auditory hallucination easily and this is the reason the meat of congenital blindness is protective for psychosis has appeared so sensory discrimination done and we came into sensory integration in all the three divisions of this talk we would periodically come back to sensory integration function because sensory integration takes a huge part in formation of positive negative cognitive emotional and somatic symptoms of psychosis and sensory integration function also take a huge role in formation of neuro progression of psychosis so we would come to it again and again and those of you who are child psychiatrists and have special interest in autism are asking yourselves so we have read sensory integration sensory integration therapy and so many things in autism how come it is do uh, it is being talked so much in schizophrenia again it is not my mistake the mistake is of dsm and icd if seen from connectomic point of view so called schizophrenia and bipolar and so called autism and adhd are almost the same so what is sensory integration it is a whole brain function and so far there so far there are inter areas of interest and not a single definitive network because this is so large a thing that whole brain is involved in it there is no not a single definitive network every brain network every every everything starting from there is not a single brain area that is not devoted to sensory integration function uh, alim main thoda zyada late kar raha hu kya hmm 924 is there uh, how oh, much time to so wait uh, or 5 minutes sir so it is multi level and multiple node interacting process where single sensory modalities are mixed matched with brain learnings and cognitive biases and process to form an accurate representation of three dimensional spatial orientation of a individual in their environment it gives us three dimensional picture this is the symptomatic view someone says the chicken is in basket our eye sees that our auditory processes that and then they are collated we understand that chicken is in basket and due to our prior prior exposure to chicken we form a mental imagery of that the areas of interest in sensory integration mostly against cerebellum cerebellum deep cerebellar nuclei then thalamus hypothalamus then <coughs> hippocampus then superior colliculus primary motor area p motor area posterior parietal cortex they are more into sensory integration at sensory level at sensory level then the visual vestibular motor reference copy and proprioception they also add to it other important nodes and hubs are thalamus basal ganglia temporal cortex various other areas of neocortex ultimately it's a whole neocortex and its interaction with subcortical structure that creates basis of multimodal sensory processing and integration to complete the three dimensional spatial imagery inside animal brain and ultimately creates the sensory integration process this is the final view of multisensory integration the 
whole brain is involved here and this is how synthesis integration is part of everything in psychiatry now what i have talked about a lot of very difficult thing can i make a schematic preparation of it so that you can take home some picture of schematics yes i can do that this is the chart diagram of delusion formation increased autobiographical processes high or extended high extended motivational or reward circuit tone and decreased inhibitory control and decreased executive function together form fixed firm belief not amenable to logical reasoning occur delusion but each of these three processes have extension increase autobiographical processes express as rumination and obsession high extended motivational circuit or reward circuit tone expresses as compulsive and impulsive behavior and decreased inhibitory control and decreased executive function expresses as attention deficit trait and addiction and addiction to process and substance abuse so you see delusion doesn't come alone it comes with these three hypofunction these three functional disturbances and rumination compulsive impulsive behavior and attention deficit trait addiction to process and substance abuse so that means all the medication that works in rumination and obsession compulsive impulsive behavior and addiction would work in hallucin would work in delusion now what is hallucination all delusion forming machinery along with disturbed sensory discrimination network disturbed sensory integration network resulting in disturbed spatial perception and orientation would cause the hallucination of all sensory modalities through auditory auditory processing sorry through auditory processing primarily the thing is if medicines for these three work in hallucination delusion so medicines for these three would work in hallucination too and so those things which work in disturbed sensory discrimination network and disturbed sensory integration network would also work in hallucination so psychopharmacology at is opening up to a exciting new possibilities all the drugs that we can use in positive symptom negative symptom and cognitive symptom can be used in autism and adhd with variable success and vice versa as today i said that i would not go into much of psychopharmacology i am keeping that for extensively for second part and third part still i am giving you idea if you understand this how the complete breakage can be done between our understanding of antipsychotic antidepressant and other thing because all of them can be applied to all these things so this is the connectomic based formulation of delusion and hallucination and then we are going to what are the molecular mechanism for it actually millions of causes and trillions of complex combination of these causes which can give rise to this type of network disturbances the crux of molecular mechanism would be heightened neural glial and immune system cell hyper excitability and the hyper excitability would then translate into individual or group neural network deviation functioning deviant functioning depending on how and why the hyper excitability causing malformation occur and then we in next series onward we return to basic understanding of neuronal hyper excitability so what would be in next episode in next episode i am giving some trailer 
we would discuss is clozapine gold standard really after 33 years we would discuss metabolic syndrome and whether it is due to drug or due to disease we would discuss catatonia and treating catatonia without giving any ect we would also start questioning what if there is at all treatment resistant schizophrenia or we are just making some patient gain that level and many more with this i am ending today's presentation i know i have bored you plus but please believe me this was needed otherwise it, it was not possible to go into the real psychopharmacology if you don't understand the actual formulation so now we are open to question thank you also thank you for a exhaustive presentation and <laughs> confuse our uh, concepts so this time i so i bola tha ke i have to fast break everything down otherwise i cannot give if i directly say prozapine is not the gold standard medication for schizophrenia tum log mujhe maar daloge but that is the true thing uske liye break karna padega this is the breaking of thing chal thank you i'll i'll, I'll meet the chairperson for their initial remarks Uh, thank you, Bhaskar, for your enlightening talk. Uh, actually, uh, frankly, to admit, uh, I, I misunderstood the topic, and uh, it was everyone a... would be because I am just trying to completely destroy the tag schizophrenia and bipolar, and I am building up major psychosis step by step. That is my motto here. yes that is very true and uh, really worth uh, so i would uh, ask manoj if you have to give any comments manoj sir actually sir just like you sir i was also not able to understand what was i should um, my actually it's okay a uh, totally a new perspective actually that it could understand it for for delusions and experience hallucinations but at the same time actually i would also like to understand whether people who resort to these uh, studies are coming from neurology and uh, non psychiatrists whether they have done any psychological interventions rather than only think about a pharmacology because understanding the basis uh, whatever is we discussed over here is it uh, is it area of interest of clinical psychologists and for working with uh, this uh, neuro behavior uh, disorders so whether they are able to develop some uh, psychological intervention that we don't need any pharmacological intervention for uh, giving uh, for delusions and hallucinations so if uh, if that can be clarified by uh, okay uh, the thing asking. is i have just started building the framework psychological what you people think as psychological intervention has not much value in treating these disorders in next talk i would give the pharmacological explanation and how sensory integration is treatable by drugs more readily more rapidly than sensory integration therapy how sensory discrimination can be treated by drug more easily how the delusion hallucination all of them are treatable with right combination of drug if i say if i started this by saying antidepressants are best drug for hallucination most people would have we take the presentation then and there but trust me in next episode 
I would build up, build this thing up and I would make antidepressant one of the best drug to be given in psychosis. I am giving hints. Clozapine is actually an antidepressant more than an antipsychotic. You are not very much audible, so I'd yeah. be happy yeah. if you... Yeah, yeah, he was referring to Majid. Hmm? Yeah, Baskar, Baskar, thank you very much. Uh, Majid hmm. uh, from Srinagar here. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's really hot topic, and it's like this thing which is besides me. It's a, a tall heater. Like the, the the talk today was really really hot and exciting that uh, you delivered. Uh, you opened actually uh, a Pandora box in the start yes. in the form of uh, defining the delusions that they are false, firm beliefs, and uh, despite giving evidence to contrary. But you said that the social cultural. Uh, aspect of it uh, probably uh, uh, has to go. So that way, uh, I think more than half of a population would qualify for delusions, at least uh, I would say in uh, certain areas, not I won't say generalize it, certain areas who firmly uh, believe in certain um, uh, cultural uh, uh, aspects. So what's your yes. take on that? The thing is, if we think this is a normative process of value value event value based decision making process and just value determination of our action is a normative trait then it is inevitable that at least one third of the population should have some errors in it if you think hypertension how many in this lecture itself have hypertension? Quite a few, including myself. Because whenever we are making something normative trait, its aberration is much more. So far, our understanding was hallucination is just a pathological process. What I tried to establish is no, hallucination is a pathological or quasi pathological expression of a normal trait. So if that normal trait is present in everyone, then more of them are prone to lapses in judgment in that area. More of them would be prone to expression of pathology of that area. So that is one thing. The second thing is in our area we our area means let's say this whole of subcontinent which starts from afghanistan to thailand this whole subcontinent is historically and genetically a very interesting area here there is thousands and th millions of expressions of abnormalities in value processing. All the valors of Rajputs, all the valors of Patans, all the things that are written in our history, they are in a way very glaring example of aberration of value judgment. Then, value judgment is determined by reward circuit partly. I have already shown that. Now, reward circuit abnormality is very much prevalent in our part of the world because this is the cross section of opioid belt and cannabis belt. Cannabis belt starts from southern Russia to Indian Ocean Islands and the opium belt starts from Afghanistan to Thailand. This is opium. I am talking about historical and prehistorical 
opium cultivation and cannabis cultivation area these two areas are responsible for modern day poppy plant and modern day cannabis plant because previously there was no such potent psychoactive substances in them humanity has selectively inbred them humanity has selectively changed these these uh, plants and their genetic code by inbreeding to produce potent psychoactive substance in them and in our part of world we are using it for millions of year as our daily ritual as our daily habits as our daily medicines most of ayurveda most of unani medicine most of siddha medicine consists of either opium or in some form of opium or cannabis so you are we are habitual users of these things for millions of years that has changed our reward circuit that is sure so it is inevitable that our value based decision making process is skewed it has to be and that is why in our area of world we can see at least 30 to 40% of population have errors in this area and that is manifested in different way so this is without any form of socio cultural influence i hope i have given you some idea what you want, what you mean to say is sort of spectrum sort of thing hmm from normal to hallucinations and in between there are mild errors of judgment yes so, so these are what you are trying to say okay yes. think... for example let's say ab ye jo abhi ipl match hua uh, last ball of the ipl final mein chennai ke char panch supporter ko dikhaya gaya jo ro rahe hain chhati phar rahe hain in spite of knowing that these are fixed matches so is it not a kind of value judgment error okay okay uh, savita ma'am because i think we are running out of time very quickly uh, savita ma'am i have a very uh, small question i put in the chat box uh, bhaskar i was just wondering what is the role of uh, signal anxiety in producing these psychotic symptoms positive psychotic symptoms basically is anxiety arising from threat to survival hmm. and uh, when there is a extreme sort of uh, stress uh, hmm. or extreme sort, sort of danger uh, situation that hmm. the person perceives and the anxiety generated out of that uh, would that Uh, by itself be able to contribute to production of psychotic symptoms that can well. provide that can provided the person's brain is already triggered for it means the person's brain already have the necessary errors in value judgment the necessary errors in various perception and perception integration then the person would develop hallucination first delusion then hallucination but without that not possible okay so if if, if the brain if there is a inhibitory control in place executive hmm. and in place and uh, uh, the value judgment uh, in place then the psychotic symptoms will not appear no not appear Okay, okay. question in the box is uh, why do we have lesser of olfactory hallucination? Because it is also we in... have very high level of olfactory hallucination. All close sensory perception, be it olfactory, be it gustatory, be it tactile, be it proprioceptive, be it. other kind of special senses which are near uh, applicable they have so much aberration and so much sensory disturbances that we don't even talk about it let's say most of the time if you are anxious you would feel a chill you would feel some kind of 
uh, tactile sensory stimulation and most of us would disregard it. That is kind of tactile hallucination. Formication. Formication, the sensation of insect is a tactile hallucination. Vasomotor symptom of menopause is a tactile hallucination. Various other forms like so-called delusional, parasit delusional parasitosis is actually a tactile hallucination which is happening due to spontaneous discharge of skin tactile nerve endings and we are making that a kind of delusion that is not delusion that is hallucination tactile hallucination Coken bug, meth mite, you name it, thousands of actually uh, close range hallucinations. Similarly, most of the time, we sm get smells, but we disregard sm many, many smells. We don't, we are not bothered about very peculiar smells most of the time. Even to perceive that smell, uh, smell is funny or wrong or we are perceiving something wrong in smell, a person has to have a very high level of scrutiny in, in his or her surrounding environment. That is why in this, sensor, in this, in this sensory areas, the aberrations are so common that our brain most of the time disregards their sensory aberration. And that is why we report their hallucinations less. But that doesn't mean there is no hallucination. We have made some of the, the hallucina uh, hallucinations delusions. As I have given example of uh, the bodily uh, disorders. Sorry, the, uh, what is the name? Uh, Delusional parasitosis. Delusional parasitosis is probably the best example of delusion, uh, given name of hallucination. Uh, so hallucination given the name of delusion. Okay, uh, Bhaskar, I think we have overshot the time quite a bit. Yes. Fans are waiting. So fans are waiting. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Actually, the I know today, today is actually people would feel disappointed because. I have not covered pharmacology that much, just given some hint. But today so, is the building. Part. Pharmacology will be there in the next next topic. Next topic, mostly pharmacology. Third topic is purely pharmacology. Okay, okay. So the, your spectrum is like that. Huh? Thank okay. you. So, so uh, over to uh, 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 your persons. Have any any final comments, uh, sir? We'll I think we'll have to invite you again, the chairpersons, Basudev sir, Manoj sir. Because this thing is still incomplete. Bhaskar has left us in a lurch, <laughs> so showing a candy and then not giving it to us. <laughs> it's not possible. Uh, no. If I do this in one session, I will take a whole day. Sure, sure, sure. People will bore. Sure. So, so any comments on the chairpersons? Because this is to be continued. I think I will say actually this is uh, very interesting and this is a new paradigm that has been uh, added to our understanding. So we'd like to definitely understand it further and, uh, you know, try to, uh, you know, manage the patient in a, uh, in a in different way from now onwards. So let us see what is uh, there uh, in, the, in the next uh, two sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Basuta, any, any comments from you? Uh, nothing as such. Uh, thank you, Bhaskar, once again for teaching all of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, funds are over to you, and you have to wind up also because uh, Amrit's connection is not working. Yes, sir, I have said that. <laughs> Thank you, Vaskar, for your again. I should use the word adjective exhaustive lecture on this topic. Uh, and uh, as you have been telling that I have made it boring many times, it's not so. But the fact remains that most of us are taught are learned in a biopsychosocial model. Biological model is also a part of understanding. 
a new novel way of understanding if it is exposed there will be a little confusion and reluctance in adopting to it why i use the word adapting because ultimate purpose is to treat the patient by, by the, on the merit of the understanding we have and i do hope in your next two sessions we will move in that regard it has not yes. been boring you introduced in a justified way you needed that time to introduce thanks a lot to you haskar and dr vasudev das and dr manoj kumar i thank you very much for being kind enough to chair the session i think we would expect you in the next two episodes of this series by dr bhaskar mukherjee and thank you alim thank you thanks a lot to amrit who attended this in spite of being in goa with family and a family trip and i thank the first amusing trip i thank the current from municipal and our for last not for the list our audience those who regularly log in and keep us engaged stimulated inspired to continue this program thanks everybody i think thank it's time you. to say good night bye thank you so much sir thank you thank you everyone good night basuka will continue the discussion on the whatsapp yes bye bye <laughs> so thank you thank you basuda thank you once again ending the meeting sir